welcome to, to, this, uh, to this launch and also especially to the authors Kim Payne, Corey Waletsko and Valerie Bard-Garrett. Yeah, so in, in shortly we're going to get, get to you to introduce yourselves uh, with, a, with um, a, a gem from the book, a game for us to play um, and to answer some questions. But first, let's welcome you from all around the world. Um, you know, there's amazing Zoom launches. And, you know, it's raining in Stroud and we're feeling rather Zoomed out, but there's all these wonderful people all over the world. So please put your name in the chat box and where you're from. And also, if you, you know, you may want to add a question later. So just take a few moments to do that. And then Susie can check, check out all the chat people. Um, Shelley Winter is sending her love and gratitude from Los Angeles. Thank you. Wow, we need the sun here. We've got rainbows. Swapna from India. Heather from Raleigh, North Carolina. Hello from Rainy Bath, that's just down the way. Well, we've got rainbows here in Stroud. Hello from Croatia. Hello from Italy, Columbia, Pennsylvania, Hawaii from Christine. Wow. So welcome everybody. I don't know how many people are due, but um, I think we've had over a hundred people. Is that right, Katie? Can't remember. Uh, okay, so, so thank you. And you may have a question. And so the first, it, before handing over to the authors, um, why, um, why publishing a games book and why now? Um, well, Hawthorne was started nearly 40 years ago with the question, what do we do instead of watching television? <laughs> yeah. So what do families do? What do schools do? What are the resources for a more creative and active family life? You know, how about movement? How about fun? So when Kim Payne moved in to, next door to our family in Stroud, um, our four children, of course, loved his playful energy. And um, I still remember one snowy evening, Kim coming home from Winstone School, absolutely shattered, but he still had time to make an igloo for our children. How about that? Mm -hmm. And so a bit, a bit, and it was a good igloo, it worked. So it a bit later, we invited Kim to, um, to write Games Children Play. And, and here it is. Um, and it's a classic, it's well translated. And, um, uh, people kept wanting an update and he kept, kept putting it off and the questions kept coming. And I think Corey asked, when are you going to update it? And so, um, you know, so we put Valerie Bard Garrett and Joan Scheimer's book um, on games, children, sing and play together with the early years. Um, thank you, Valerie, for showing that classic. And let's remember Joan. Um, so we thought we'd put them together, the early years from Games Children Play, into what I hope will become a new classic, a treasure chest for play. And Games Children Play 2 will be out this winter. So the, the next question and the story, and that was, we published that in 1996, uh, Kim, Kim John. Oh my. <laughs> so it's, a, it's about time, isn't it? <laughs> so why now? So we need to get out and play post lockdown more than ever. And today, UK-wide children's and family groups have announced a summer of play, you know? So get out there and play in your community, in your schools and, and families. It's an invitation. So this book is just right. And also it's right for me because I've got a two and a half year grandson called Leo who, who insists on playing a sailor went to CCC. But I won't do it because I'll get, I'll get it wrong. If he's there, it's right. So it's good for me as a grandfather. So thank you, Kim, Corey, and Valerie. So now I'd like to... Um, oh, by the way, the sailor went to CCC, goes very well on Zoom, you know? It's really it's Zoom free. And then he gives you a coffee, sort of helping you through the, the screen. So now, welcome to chaos, creative chaos. And I'd like each of the, the authors to introduce themselves in turn, perhaps a bit playfully. And with a, with a game, we can all have a go at, describing a bit how it works. And um, is that trying it out? 
So over over to you, Kim. Are you first or Corey? Oh, or no, Corey, Corey is absolutely Corey. Do you want to go? Do you want to go first? And Martin, I do remember the igloo. I, <laughs> I do. We, we, we sat out in that igloo. To build an igloo in, in England is no small undertaking with, <laughs> with like one inch of snow. So yeah, but Corey, please. So you did ask if I wanted to go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, first, I just want to say how overwhelming and awesome it is to see everybody here. Um, we made it <laughs> through a year, you know, a year of chaos and unknown. Um, and I think uh, coming out of the other side of this, I think that the art of play um, couldn't be more important. So thank you for playing with us. Uh, my name is Corey Willetsko. Um, I'm tuning in from uh, Cuici, Vermont, where I teach movement and games to grades one through eight. Um, and I teach outside. <laughs> and it's not always this warm outside. So um, this new book has a whole section of uh, snowy day snow games. Um, and so today I will ask you to join me in learning a twist on an old classic. So the classic is head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Most of us know it from head to toe. However, now we have a bit of a twist and this is anyone who um, has ventured into um, the art of skiing. Maybe it's cross country, maybe it's downhill. So for this game, you actually have to stand up. So I'll invite us all to stand as you are able. You can do this game seated. So I'm going to change my camera angle so from head to toe you'd be able to see. So now I have head is here. And toes are here. I'm just double checking. Everyone's out from head to toe, here to here. We're going to take head, shoulders, knees, and toes, and we're turning it into helmet, goggles, skis, and poles. <laughs> skis and poles. It might help if you want to take a moment to pin my video. You can go to the upper right hand corner of the little blue square with the three white dots and then you can see um, the big picture. All right, so we have helmet, goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles, helmet, goggles, skis and poles, Skis and poles and hat and gloves, snow pants and coat, helmet goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles. So I'm going to take a moment here and I'm actually going to pin my video too. Oh, it's not letting me. Oh, that's okay. All right. So um, the fun one here is that you can do it at any speed. Shall we try a little faster? Um, there will be children who don't want to go all the way down to the skis all the way down here. And you can encourage them to go ahead and relax all the way down. So we'll try a little faster. Ready? Here we go. Helmet, goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles. Helmet, goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles, and hat and gloves, snow pants and coat. Helmet, goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles. Now we take one away. Goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles. Goggles, skis and poles. 
sleeves and poles and hat and gloves, snow pants and coat, goggles, skis and poles, skis and poles. Maybe we'll do one more. Skis and poles, skis and poles. Skis and poles, skis and poles, and hat and gloves, snow pants and coat. Skis and poles, skis and poles. Woo! Well, thank you all. It's so fun to see people moving through the screens. <sighs> Delightful, a wonderful um, seventh inning stretch for a long Zoom meeting. It's not just for kids. So thanks, Curry. And does Valerie and Kim have one? An introduction and a game. Shall I go next, Kim? Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Valerie Bo Garrett and I'm um, with you all from Sacramento, California. Um, where it will be 90 degrees today. Um, uh, I was a movement educator at the San Francisco Waldorf School for 15 years, worked with all the grades, kindergarten through 12th grade, developing curriculum with them, using lots of uh, games from Kim's collection. Thank you, it was essential for the toolkit for a new teacher. And after I uh, uh, left the school. I did a lot of um, uh, freelancing around the world, actually, in Asia, China, and Taiwan in particular, and working with uh, young children and their families in uh, developmental movement programs in local preschools, which is uh, where the collection began um, uh, for the games children sing and play um, with Joan Karsheimer, who was 93 two years ago when she, when she did pass. She shared so many singing games and um, wonderful wisdom with these early movements that um, I uh, am honored to uh, continue to bring out into the world, um, along with uh, movements from Jamin McMillan um, and Heather Lanier, all of her con contributors to the work in a worldwide sense need to uh, uh, bend my chapeau to them. Um, the game that I would like to share today um, is Caterpillar Crawls Along. It's a game from Heather Lanier. Um, use it with my own little, little ones, one-on-one um, -on -one with, uh, with them in a small preschool setting, in workshop settings with uh, parents and teachers, and even the past few years, my work uh, at Maristem with young adults with autism. So uh, uh, this game in, per in particular works with some series of what I call foundational movements, very early movements, including worming and squirming along the ground. Many children these days uh, don't get a lot of time on the ground. In, um, developing their own movement, imitating others and imitating animal movements. And these are very uh, critical for their neurological development and social development in creating um, their body map where they are in the world and where everything else is. So I have my little, uh, I have a helper with me today since I don't have an actual little one. We'll also do a, a, a camera angle change. Here we have little Ruby, who uh, came to being from a second grade knitting project. Um, so in this uh, little game, Caterpillar Crawls Along, here, I'm gonna get down here. Um, a caterpillar crawls along and gets wrapped up in its little cocoon and becomes a butterfly. And you would have a t large towel or a blanket on the floor in a preschool setting, I have the children on their tummies against one wall with their feet on the wall, waiting their turn, which is my, my eyeballing them and giving them a little nod so they know how to wait and 
uh, wait their turn and know when to go. And I, and I sing the little song. So little Pr Ruby is gonna do her best to demonstrate. She's gonna be uh, worming along the, the, the floor, um, caterpillar crawl or uh, commando crawl maybe, however they do it. It's very interesting to see the different variations in, the, in this movement across the floor. Caterpillar crawls along. In and out she sings her song. Then she's rolled up by and by. Then she becomes a butterfly. Fly away, butterfly and she will fly away and trot back to where she came. So very simple doing it in real life. However, less simple. They take a long time to, cr to crawl forward. So I sing very slowly and give them plenty of time. And uh, I do lots of adjustments to make it work for them. We'll do it one, uh, show it one more time and I will uh, make comments as we go. So Ruby knows it's her turn. Caterpillar crawls along, in and out she sings her song, and she gets adjusted so her head is free, and her arms are down, and I'm touching her and giving her a little bit of compression already, so she knows what that is going to feel like. And they all love this very much. And the ones who need it the most ask for it. Then she's rolled up. Take my time and give a lot of pressure as much as I think that they can take. Bye and bye. I might check again and do a few extra squeezes, especially on the ones who really, really, really want it. Then, and I, she becomes a butterfly, fly away butterfly. And the unrolling is actually done very, very slowly. It's very disorienting for the children. They're little, they're very little and they are getting, gonna get dizzy, um, which is actually uh, helping to develop their balance system, their vestibular system. So they've had this compression, on their joints, their shoulders, and their arms, feel a squeeze, and then they have the release to become the butterfly and fly away to their, their spot at the, side, at the side of the room. So I found that um, children who are, what we might say, squirrely, very active, very, very uh, enthusiastic and moving this way and that way, are the ones who really ask for this game. Please, teacher Valerie, please, can we, can I be the butterfly? Can I be the caterpillar? And I, and maybe they might be the one I demonstrate with so that they get an extra dose of squeezing. Thank and you. that is on page 49, I believe, 40, 49 of our book. And there's the instructions and the little tune. And if you sing it differently, that's okay, because the way you sing it is the way it is. So thanks, Valerie. I feel like a caterpillar become a, a butterfly, even, even though it's the evening and even though it's wet, I feel like a butterfly already. So thank All you. Right. You're welcome. And, and for that transformation. And, and Kim, what treat do you have? Uh, you were going to introduce yourself a bit playfully, but also also a game. As this 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 uh, feast of games was your idea, wasn't it? <laughs> Guilty. Um, you, you know, Valerie. Um, so interesting because there's another game in the book which uh, is called Who's Under the Blanket. Mm. And it's it's a such a classic game where where a child. Um, 
uh, you know, is under a blanket, as you know, and uh, well, there's children are sitting in a circle around a blanket and, and one child is, 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 everyone closes their eyes and one child hides under the blanket and the children open and they have to try and guess who's under the blanket, but because they're so little, it's it often very often they don't they don't tend to look around the circle to say who is not here. The big six-year-olds sometimes do that, you know, but the little ones and they come up and they they're allowed one by one to give the blanket a little rub. Mm. And I started playing that more as I realized children's just needed that little bit of a a rub. A little bit of a you know like like the like the blanket you were using and they give a little bit of a rub and sometimes there's a little bit of a giggle which is a good clue <laughs> and so yeah if if anyone uh, tuning in today wanted to see another one of those types of games um that's perhaps an extension that's wonderful. Thank but, you. Yeah, but Martin, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Kim, John Payne, and um, I just had uh, the greatest time putting this book together with Valerie and Corey, and it was just such fun. My, my background was, um, yep, in, in movement. Um, before uh, um, uh, training as a movement teacher and working as a movement teacher, I trained in psychology and I'm okay now. I always say that really quickly uh, after that, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I've fully recovered from a training in psychology and um, it's a long haul. And, um, and I've always been putting the two together for years of, of children playing and then helping children who can't play or who struggle to play or who, um, who play um, triggers, behaviors. I've always enjoyed frankly the behavior it triggers because it's a whole lot easier to work out during a game than it is for a parent at bath time <laughs> you know? um, it's just more playful it's easier and it's more um explosive right Valerie Corey it it, it, it tends to come out very um, colorfully uh so that so um a lot of the games in this book you'll see, and particularly the next book, Games Children Play 2, uh, have tips for how, what, you know, what about children who, who struggle to play? And then, um, uh, yes, I, I um, continued on. Um, I was the co-director of what was then called the Michael Institute for Bothma Gymnastics and Spatial Dynamics. Nowadays, that's called Bothma International. Um, the name change there, but did that for a, a long, long time. And, um, and then went more in the parenting direction. So, you know, we have Valerie with the very young children, Corey, who's very contemporary working. And then my interest in parenting, it's like it was a good choice of team, Martin, to put together. Very good choice of team. Um, so that's that's my background. I've been writing. I've written some some books and such as as well, and and have a private family counselling practice right to this day. So you know, I'm, I've been speaking with a bunch of parents just this morning before today. So it's very contemporary. So now the game I chose um, it, it comes as uh, uh, perhaps this is the slow movement. Corey, you started off with a bang. Um, I wondered if this might be easier to screen share so you can um, follow this along. I'll see if I can um, pop this up on screen for us. Corey, I can see your, uh, is that come through? Yes. It yes. has? Okay, yep. good. This is called the Gnome's New Hat. And this is an example of, of a game um, can you, uh, Corey, can you still see my image when, as I show it? Yes, but it's very small. But okay. We can see it. We can All see right. you and we can see your string and we can see largely the page. Okay, good. That, uh, as indeed it should be. There we are. Um, so um, the Gnome's New Hat is, is a, one of these games that I think are becoming uh, increasingly important for children uh, we, who, who enter into a game a little bit anxious, like a string and fingers and, oh no, I, I can't do it, you know, and that kind of, 
or sitting back a little bit. But this, um, I think more and more, we're playing games and finding games with stories are just the thing. That games that, that can carry children along with caterpillars and goggles and games, the, the games have always had that. But Corey and Valerie, I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm finding the more the, there's the living picture in the game, the less the child is, 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 is fearful and reticent, and the more they come into their limbic system in their brain, not so much in the, in the early stages of this fight or flight in the, in the amygdala, you know, they're just a little more um, there, held by the picture. So this is one of those. And I'll read it through and I'll move the screen because I have, um, it's a, is it about large enough, Corey, to, to read with me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. <clears throat> so once upon a time, there were four gnomes. Now, as everyone knows, gnomes always wear hats. However, these gnomes had lost their hats. So they went to the hat maker in the neighboring village. Please, Mr. Hat maker, could you make us four new hats? The hat maker bowed, certainly, dear gnomes, he said. He called to his helper to fetch some thread from the cupboard. And the helper reached between the hatter and the pointer and took out some thread. So, so now we're here. Um, and I won't read all the instructions. I'll just, um, it's in the book, of course. Um, so nice to be able to say that it's in the book. Um, so the helper did a magic dance. With the thread on his finger, he pointed away from the gnomes, then up to the sky, yeah, up to the sky and walked over to the pointer gnome and slipped on his new, slipped the hat on his head. I'll scroll up so you can see the next picture. He then reached between the pointer gnome, oops, the pointer gnome and the long one gnome and took out some thread and did the same magic dance and put a newly made hat on the long one's head. Cross here and down there. He then reached between the long one and the ring one and took out some thread and he did the dance and placed it on the ring one's head. Finally, he reached between the ring one and the pinky gnome and drew out some thread, did his magic dance and placed the hat on the pinky gnome head. Now here, just to um, interrupt the story a wee bit, um, one of the other things, Corey and Valerie, I, I wonder if you're finding is, games with a lot of simple repetition. And there's always been games with repetition, but I'm finding them more and more healing. Children can really settle into the repetitiveness um, because they know what's coming next. And goodness knows this year, we haven't known what's coming next. And these gnomes do, you see. <laughs> <laughs> now, the gnomes were very pleased and, and they thanked and they bowed their head, their head to the hatter and bowed their head to the helper and, and a, a bowed and took the hatter bowed and took off his own hat and whispered something to the helper. Let's see if I can scroll across and see that. Um, there we are. In Pompeii, beards and beer, hip hop hat, and disappear. And as these words were being said, the helper took hold of a special thread that was unseen by the gnomes. And as soon as the gnomes were all outside on the street, whoosh, and the helper pulled on the thread and the hats all disappeared. Uh, uh. There's, a, there's just that magic. Little, that little bit of magic. I'll, I'll come out of uh, um, screen sharing now. Good. So um, that kind of I, I chose that game because it was 
rather um, it had some of those aspects that we talked about, very um, tactile Valerie, right? Very, very tactile, repetitiveness, but a story that carries it all the way through. Valerie, I don't know, and Corey, if you're finding this, but I'm sometimes finding now that I actually need to tell this, the, the entirety of the story first and then and preview all that's going to happen without losing the magic, but previewing, previewing, previewing. Are you finding that more, Corey, that you're previewing games for the children who are anxious and nervous or not so much? I do think the repetition is good. Um, sometimes there are squirrely ones who, when there's too many words, they, they don't have the patience for all the words. But then maybe we can preview with movement also. There's different ways to preview. It's not all verbal. Yep. Yes, yes. And the preview has to be, I think of the three Ps, preview uh, and preview practically um, make it very, make it, and make it very pictorial, practical, pictorial previewing. Yeah. Yeah. Martin, yeah. back to Tim, you. Here we are. Tim, I've got a question from Elisa Irma Cora. Dear Kim, what age do you think this game would suit children best before we move on? Well, you know, finger games make lovely rainy day games. Um, and some very, like that one is a little more complicated because it involves twisting, but you can play some very, very simple uh, finger games, you know, making necklaces and so on. And thing, um, and that can be around four, Valerie, right? Four, five, very, very simple. So that the string becomes a friend. And so by the time, uh, and you can even play little string games with with um, this little piggy, and you can even do little touches with. Um, um, and uh, there was one little boy I was um, helping um, Mama, a new baby arrival, and he'd waited nine months for this this baby brother to come, and this baby brother came and the baby sister, and that was okay, but then he just wanted to play, and she wasn't doing anything. You know, and so um, and he uh, his touch was a little bit rough um, with the baby. So we played we played piggies like this with the string and they played it and they played it and they played it. And he was four, three and a half, four. And baby was just a tiny little infant. And um, they made good friends through it. Mm. But Thank you, that was absolutely magic. Although uh, I, I must say I was in knots a bit. Yes, oh. rightly so. There so, was a question earlier. Um, Dale had a question for Valerie about the movement after coming out of the cocoon. They become a butterfly. So it's an actual butterfly. flying movement. But building on, uh, thanks Dale for that question. Um, building on what uh, Kim was uh, just touching on about how to, about previewing the game for the children, for the little ones, um, these cre uh, creatures or uh, phenomenon, the little gnome, needs to be something that they already know. If a caterpillar crawls along, doesn't make any sense if they've never seen a caterpillar or looked at one, a real one. And so to prepare, um, Ideally, this would be done in the home life, in the outdoors, in the garden, where they ideally would spend six or eight hours a day getting familiar with the ladybugs and, and, and the little beetle bugs. And then when we have um, little, little characters in the stories, and, and you're absolutely right, Kim, that, that, that uh, these games are not cold. They're very warmed by... Uh, lived experiences and this inner picturing um, that that can develop as, as you know very very young I, we hope of something that they know of um, even my little one who's 18 months she goes no me's she says just, just see anything with a little red peak is 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 going to be a no me <laughs> and she's she's right ready for to do anything with a no me or now caterpillar or beetle bug so, so thank you. And just a few few questions now. And just to go back in our biographies, I think um, to be human is 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 to play, isn't it? And 
if you go back in your biographies, one of the, hap the happiest memories are of, of play when you were a young child. However, when my sister used to do sharks, um, and, and if you didn't get to an island on the floor, you were eaten. That's not so a happy, happy memory. So anyway, so we, we all have these, these memories of uh, like skipping or whatever, or my, I was playing forever in a stream. So, so Corrie, just a question. What, why are games and play important? And, and why do they really matter now? What a good question. Um, uh, one thing I, I do want to say that ties all of these together is the sense of touch. And now more than ever, the sense of um, touch in our school, we, we weren't allowed this year in the grades. No tag even. <laughs> so we had to come up with you know, how do you how do you actually play touch and go without touch? Um, so what I love about these games is that they are uh, family friendly and then early childhood friendly so that the regulations um, are not as stringent as they are for older kids. So touch and the senses um, is hugely important. Of course, we know because we're, what are we doing right now? We're sitting in front of our screens, mm. which is not tactile. Um, there's another part of our humanity that is required in screen time. Yeah. And it's here, whether we like it or not. So to balance out all of our screen time in the ethers to have as much tactile um, real life experience as possible i think is healing and it's not just for children it's for us as well martin if i could add to that if i may Corey, just build on that is that um one of the things that uh we all know really are saying the obvious is um is play is 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 deep Digest, um, sensory digestion. Play is when children play out their lives. They play the world. They play experiences, and it's almost like they're. It's almost like a sensory digestion process. <clears throat> and the food that they eat through the day, through busy car rides and going to school and. Um, and then being picked up and then going here and there and then coming home and and so on and so on and so on. There's, there's myriad images that a child has through the day. And what play does is it digests it, just like our tummies digest food. Imagine eating and eating and eating and having no digestion. And that for a child um, is, is just as necessary. Their lives are taking in so many things. And then play is, is the digestion. Play is what makes the nutrients of their day available to their being. And um, a, a, a day rich in play, um, I remember my, my own daughter said to me once uh, at night time, and we were doing our little remembering back with our rose and thorn, a rose for the day, that best thing, our thorn for the yuckiest, a thorn for tomorrow. What's going to be a yucky thing about tomorrow? A rose for tomorrow. What's the nicest thing? And she said in her um, her rose, which said, Daddy, we played very hard today. <laughs> and she was, you see, it's there. <laughs> and um, and her sister said, yes. And they they were so full and brimming of play. And then very shortly afterwards, very shortly afterwards, clunk to sleep because they had digested the day. Thank you. So to move on, I'm, I'm conscious we've got about 15 minutes left, 15, 20 minutes left. So, so that, can you, the three of you think of where, of a particular child where play has made a, a particular difference to the way they were, uh, uh, you know, stories. Because, so, you know, a functional instrumental approach to play, you know, they, they use it for learning and all that, but play is wonderful in itself. But 
can you think of examples where play has made a, a difference to a particular child? I mean, Bowery, well, how, how about you? Well, I'm thinking about these um, early movement patterns that um, we, uh, uh, that are uh, not just archetypal, but they're, they're universal for mm -hmm. all of us to, to move from the horizontal to vertical through, um, through certain sequences. And um, many children uh, skip steps. May, and we know about this. We, you know, maybe someone didn't crawl. They just started standing and walking. And aren't they so bright because they just are in a hurry to be in the world? But um, they can't. They they have missed something in their in their development. And how to bring that possibility back through a picture story, through a imagination, mm -hmm. using the voice, the teacher or the caregiver's voice, using. Uh, dynamic rhythm in the tone of how uh, the words play out have created the condition where children can get on their tummy again and do some squirmy wormies, uh, maybe even crawl again through because they're going on an adventure that is set up for them. And perhaps they've seen the one ahead of them do it. Um, and I've actually seen within it feels like seconds from being unable to do a certain a certain movement sequence that we know is essential to totally nailing it and never not being able to do it again out of this storytelling and the 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 use of the rhythmic use of the voice and the creating of a of a picture again and again lesson after lesson or afternoon after afternoon so absolutely yeah. Any other stories? Oh, Corey, what happened today? Oh, right. I believe it or not, I got permission to get the maypole out, which was <laughs> fabulous. We didn't know if we could do it, and and it was first grade, and I could say, make sure to hold on tight and keep your ribbon straight otherwise it's gonna blow out of your hands and I, it's gonna take forever right i could say that but instead we're sailors and the wind is coming so you've got to batten down the hatches and to see them live into the imagery of being on a boat and and having to hang on for the for the wind with the sails um it was just so beautiful but i guess i would say back to play um, I think it used to be that we just, when I grew up, we just went out for recess and, and the, the adults and teachers just said, well, good luck. Now we get a coffee break. Mm -hmm. And we just did stuff. We just, we got into stuff, but we just played. We just did stuff. And I have noticed that it's not a given that children know, know how to play. Mm -hmm. And how terrifying a thing to go out to this vast, wide world of chaos and not know what to do so i think that the rhythmic repetitions of um even the playground games of teaching them so they know i have a place to be i know where i belong um i think is a new thing maybe somewhat new Amen. and i don't know why but i do know that um the games and the previewing of who's going to be doing what when is um, a lifeline for many young people. And to add to that, Corey, if I may, the, um, Corey, you and I have worked in the realm of social inclusion. And um, uh, Martin, one of the things uh, that I train children in the eighth grade in a school like Corey's, which is K through eight, um, is that they become uh, play mentors. And so the eighth grade um, uh, are um, renew, renewing the old game oral traditions. And so they'll go out and they will turn the jump rope with the, with the, with the rhymes. They, they will play the games, uh, probably, probably some involve sharks, I'm afraid. But, the, <laughs> but the, the, they're, 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 doing, they're, they're playing the chasing games, the tagging games. And you see these eighth graders fan out in the playground, 
reintroducing the oral traditions because we can despair that the oral traditions are breaking down and you think oh no you know ipads and all this is breaking down our oral traditions but you get you get a bunch of eighth graders going out in a playground who have they have to be retaught the games a little bit but then they go out and you see how play and games uh is is so deeply embedded in our soul it takes so little for these children to start clustering around these great big eighth, well, they're not eighth graders to a little child, they're demigods recently descended from Olympus, right? That's <laughs> they are. Um, and, and, and it's game on, you know? Um, and, and you just, it gives me heart to see how light a touch is needed. And when we train these eighth graders to do this, we, we also train them in, in how to start a game and then how to sort of step back and how to let the children play and then how to scan the game of who is struggling and, and move in and, and help them. There's a range of things they do to help them. And it's so um, uplifting to see these game mentors do this work. That's just a great story about renewing games culture. Absolutely great story. And, and the, the, what, a question that's come up for many people is, you know, screen culture and, and how, how do you help children struggling to play in real life? You know, they've perhaps been working with computer games or whatever and have been um, um, entranced by this Pied Piper medium. So, any, any tips there or, or stories? Corey, to you? Uh, well, I do. Um, it may be more um, relevant for the next edition that's coming out. I know that Dale is having this question of how to merge differing groups, right? The super athletic and the ones who maybe are reorienting to their physical bodies after COVID. Um, all of the icebreaker games, like the old party games <laughs> that it, it, you know, not capture the flag and all of these really sort of t us against them, but goofy, silly stuff that's enlivening the space between players for all ages, mm. right? So not just for elementary age, but for parents and, and families too. Um, there will be lots more of those um, coming up in the next in the next book, but good old icebreakers, yeah. goofy, silly. Yes, I've noticed working with adult groups, how useful the icebreakers in games children play are. I, I don't know if you're finding this, but when I look at a game, when I consider a game for children now, I, I look at um, multiple layers. So I look at a game where, for instance, bunnies and burrows, if the children are going to run from one, one hoop on the ground to the other. Now that's very challenging for a six-year-old, a seven-year-old sometimes to do, but you can have some stay-at-home bunnies yeah. and, and, <laughs> and the stay-at-home bunnies like nothing more than just to sit and nibble on a carrot and they open the door to the running bunnies and running bunnies um, are, are, are all, you know, very, very active and the stay-at-home, I mean, someone has to stay at home and make sure that the door is open <laughs> and, you know, and they're given their little task that slowly, slowly what they do, and this is a long interest of mine um, in, in, in brain development for children, it's very important to understand that children need to see it, not just hear it, as you were saying before, Corey, through speech, but if they can, if you can look at a game in, 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 in our book and say, you know what, there are the multi-layers, or you know what, I'm gonna make this layer so that when a child can still be with us, but through mirror neuron activity, through that ability to mirror movement, be, for example, you know, the, a, 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 um, a stay-at-home bunny with a with a, a, and who opens the door and closes the door, but sees movement over and over and over, and the mirror neurons which have been laid sedentary, not not um, uh, not damaged. That's very important. They're sedentary but not damaged, and so. 
to enliven that though that the axions, those little hooking activity. You can place a child in, an, and it could be as simple as just having a child sit with you and count how many bean bags are passed from one to the other, and and um, and you hold the basket that they go into, but they witness the movement as much as possible. I'm trying to have the child, and this is not just a random find a role. I'm really trying to have a child see the movement. And you can, and I've seen children, Valerie, I don't know if you've seen this too. I've seen children almost, you, they, they start to um, mirror and they'll start to move with the movement if it's, if it's a beanbag and, and they'll start and you see their little bodies start to move even without their hands moving. If one had have tried to push them into the full-blooded game, they would have backed off because they would be in free fall. They wouldn't know, they wouldn't know. So uh, Dale, great question. Thank you for that because it's, it's a question of our time, right? Trust in imitation. It's another way of, of talking about mirror neurons, um, but have, have games and even whisper to a child saying, did you see what Rowan just did? He put that in from one hand to another so beautifully. Did you see that catch? Oh my goodness. And just, and you might even emphasize a little bit if a child's looking away and not, not really absorbing. The best way to, of course, is to have them have a role. Thanks, Dale. That's the very brief answer. That's, um, that, that, was that was a long answer, Corey, for you and I, but it's Dale's fault because that was such a good question. Yes. I think the kindergarten teachers see this quite a bit and, and have, have that in, in circle time, the children who uh, are not quite able to engage in, in that, but with a mixed age kindergarten, you have the benefit of the older ones, you know, showing it again and again, and the little ones uh, uh, doing the movement, the inner movement, as you were describing Kim, until they are really ready to, to, to take a step toward it. Mm. So we've got a real treasure chest of resources and a worldwide network of play leaders, teachers, therapists, creative people, movement people like yourselves. You know, it's, it's really awe-inspiring to hear your stories. And, and the book is just the tip of the iceberg. And, and hopefully, you know, the, the, the yeast will keep going. But I just wondered very briefly before we finish, post lockdown, um, how can we promote more of a games culture in our communities, in our schools, in our families? Do, do you have anything going, any plans for the summer in the States? Here we're planning a summer of, of play. Um, locally, we're setting aside weekends at a farm, 50 minutes walk from here with play leaders and forest school leaders. You know, that's some, something we're doing, sponsoring as a press, but you know, any any tips on how, how we can use this magic? Um, Corey, Valerie? Um, one of the things um, that, that uh, I, I, I think of this in concentric circles, Martin, one of the ways <clears throat> to lead children back into play it, um, uh, is, um, well, there's a couple of things. Firstly, is, is, is they, they do it I'm thinking of, of attachment theory, frankly. And, and when you put, put a little one down in the park and, and, they, and they, they put their legs up and they don't want to, they don't want to play. No, uh, you know, and, and they climb up you like a squirrel and hide and, you know, um, and then uh, they watch and they watch and they watch and then they give the put me down wiggle, right, Valerie? The put me down mm -hmm, wiggle. Exactly. <laughs> yes, Martin. And the put me down wiggle, and you put the, and they take and they uh, they hold your your pants and they or your skirt and they take three or four steps away and then they come back and then they go a little further then come back a little further. What we're dealing with right now is this kind of attachment theory, uh, you know, John Bowlby and these attachment theory on a very large scale. And I think we have to be somewhat careful in just saying, let's play. <laughs> <laughs> right, because that's just that's. Um, I, I think if we can be taking children into play environments and accompanying them, and taking them, frankly, into work environments where they're working with the animals, with the land, uh, you know, seeing some caterpillars, Valerie, you know, going for little walks, noticing, being, 
and, and the more then we can bridge them into play. So, and then eventually just be stepping back and allowing them to come back to us and snuggle without thinking, oh my goodness, I'm, my child's not socializing. They're doing their very best. And I think to allow them to come back to safe harbor, back to daddy, mama, grandparent, guardian, allow them to come back to aunt, uncle, and then go out again. I, I've seen it already. Um, a lot of waving, a lot of moving out and coming back, but out just a little tiny bit and then back. And if we allow them the comfort to come back and, and really have it be okay, and then out they go again. I think we're, you know, when you look at children's play at the moment, as I have been quite intensively, I'm seeing hesitancy. Yeah. And I'm also seeing other children who go into it in a very goofy, rolling about, not doing so well way. And so we're in for, a, I think we're in for a year or two of reintroducing the children back into this environment. And Valerie, the game, for example, that the, the, the caterpillar game that you played, more and more of those games that, that bring children back into their vestibular system, back into their proprioception, where am I in space? And, and that game, Valerie, was so safe, so very safe. That's just one of those little steps out. And, it's, and so I think if we're judging as we ripple out that we don't place our children in overwhelming play environments, but little simple ones and then lead them slowly outwards. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. That, I think there's a lot of parent education to come with that. To, for the parents who are also clinging. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. It seems to me that the most encouraging way for children to play is for them to see the adults playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we got to get out and do it ourselves. Yes. Get, yeah. about, get out of our screens yeah. ourselves. Yes. That's, that's, yes. That's key. Yeah. So look, this has been an absolutely wonderful hour to to bless your great book and and also to you know that there'll be a film circulated by katie to the participants um who who were unable to join us for whatever reason so that will accelerate the networking and i and i hope the book will will continue to flourish and it won't be 25 years until it's republished okay this time so reworked and updated because there's a huge amount of wisdom and experience and wonderful observations in what you've been and what you've brought. And so just to bring this to a close, to thank participants, to thank the audience, to thank Katie and Susie for creating this event. And it's been really inspiring. And of course, I do do this as a publisher. Here's the, here's the book. <laughs> it is available from the website. And uh, give it to grandparents, give it to teachers, give it to whoever, students, because um, I, I wish I'd had this when I was starting out in teaching. You know, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a tisket a tasket was my uh, a yellow, little yellow basket. You know, I sent a letter of my, my love. That was my standby. So I wish I'd had this or all, all those, all those many years Actually, ago. It's in the book, Martin. It is. That's fantastic. <laughs> yes, I, I'm really <laughs> delighted. So, so thank you very much. And um, yeah, it's available from my website, from Steiner Books in the States, from Bob and Nancy's bookshop, whatever it is now, and um, the, 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 the etc. So do, do um, celebrate that. And I think we're in for more rainy day games here in Stroud. So thank you very much and thank look you. forward. But Martin, thank you to you for your trust you. and belief in this process. Big thank you to you. Thank you. So let's play. Let's play. <laughs> let's play. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Bye.